Hello, believers, non-believers, and everyone in between. You're listening to Stories with Sapphire. I am Sapphire Sandalo. Now get cozy and open your mind because it's story time. I recently finished this series on Netflix called Brand New Cherry Flavor. If you're into very trippy, surreal body horror, then I recommend checking it out, but maybe don't watch it while eating. Anyway, it follows a young woman who teams up with a witch to curse a man who screwed her over. As the series continues, everything spirals out of control, but it got me wondering. Is there any situation where I'd be angry enough to be willing to put a curse on someone? And are all curses evil or are some justifiable? I'd like to pose the same questions to you as you listen to this week's true stories. For the purposes of this episode, I'll be defining a curse as the causing of harm to another using supernatural means. First, I share a story about a family who's worried that their cousin would seek revenge on them after death. Then I speak with Elizabeth Corpus about her family's history with Barang. And finally, I share a tale about a teenager who encountered the Native American tree witches. Chapter 1. The Pantianak. Submitted by Nurul and Fela. Our cousin Gina had just got out of her divorce trial. Her husband had cheated on her with a wealthy, beautiful young woman. What made it even more heartbreaking was that she was seven months pregnant with his baby. She was devastated that the person she loved didn't hesitate to leave her during her weakest time. After the trial, we offered her a ride home, but she said she wanted to calm her mind and drive to a nearby park, alone. She said she wouldn't be long. So we left. In our car was me, my brother Darren, and our cousins Anissa and Juan. Do you think she'll be okay? asked Anissa. It's a rough time for her. We should give her space for now, answered Juan, who was also Gina's younger brother. For some reason, I felt uncomfortable leaving Gina by herself, but I just brushed off the feeling and assured myself that everything was fine. We decided to go and eat at a nearby restaurant before heading to our grandpa's house. It's common for us to have family gatherings there. When we got there, all of our family members were crying. As it turns out, Gina got into a horrific car crash that killed both her and her baby. After her funeral, we couldn't help but feel guilty. If we gave her a ride that day, maybe none of this would have happened. She was in no condition to be driving on her own. Why did we let her do that? Juan felt the most guilty because he just lost his older sister. He couldn't stand the feeling and confided in our grandma that he believed it was our fault that Gina was now dead. She asked, You all really feel responsible for her death? We nodded. She continued, Go get nails, scissors, anything that's sharp. I'm afraid to say this, but the way she died, Gina could possibly turn into a Pantianak. Pantianak is the vengeful spirit of a pregnant woman who died before giving birth. According to my grandma, this spirit wanders around seeking out living pregnant women and kills their unborn children out of jealousy. But in some cases, Pantianak might search for the ones who caused her death to either kill them or haunt them for the rest of their lives. We froze. Don't worry, our grandma said. Pantianak are afraid of sharp objects. Make sure you have sharp things nearby at all times, especially during the night, until her 40th day of death. My brother Darren asked, why do we need to wait for 40 days? The first 40 days is when the spirit of the dead still has a strong bond to this world. All I want you to do is be cautious and pray as much as you can in this 40-day period. Understand? We nodded again. 
Anissa and I agreed to sleep in the same room for 40 days. The same went to my brother and Juan, who slept in the other room together. We prepared nails, scissors, pocket knives, anything and everything with a point. During those 40 days, I had very strange, disturbing nightmares. They were always about a lady who ate her own newborn. Same went for my cousins and brother. We felt like we were being followed and were always disturbed by random sounds. But we never let down our guard. We constantly prayed, all while counting down the days until 40. Right on her 39th day of death, we heard some very tragic news. Apparently, Gina's ex-husband had been seeing Gina's reflection every time he looked in the mirror. One day... He became so overwhelmed that when he saw Gina in the mirror again, he banged his head on the mirror as hard as possible. Not once, not twice, but so many times that he died on the spot. The next day, we all heaved a collective sigh of relief, knowing that Gina had now passed on and was not going to come for us. But I actually did see Gina again that night. I had another dream, not a nightmare this time. There was Gina, standing still in front of me. I began apologizing profusely to her, but she stopped me and wrapped her arms tightly around me. It's okay. It was not your fault, she said. The next morning, I told Anissa, Darren, and Juan about the dream. They were all shocked, not because Gina had visited me, but because they all had the exact same dream. The Pontianak is a famous ghost in Malaysian, Indonesian, and Singaporean folklore. She is created when a woman dies before giving birth, or if she dies violently at the hands of men. She emits a high-pitched baby-like cry to lure you towards her. If you get close enough, She will tear out your organs with her long fingernails and consume them. As with all folklore, these details can vary depending on who is telling the story. These types of vengeful female ghost stories are found in cultures all over the world. They can serve as a warning to not harm women, and some people even find these stories empowering. But is it really justice if only deceased women are avenged? Chapter two, Barang. Okay, uh, my name's Elizabeth Corbus. I'm currently in Las Vegas, Nevada. Elizabeth and I were connected because my writing partner, Carla Nappi, was on a live stream that Elizabeth and her husband regularly watch called Spine Ticks Livestream Hangout. Carla mentioned the pilot that we're currently working on for an animated horror series entitled Nabarang. Um, I had, at the moment, I had stepped away from my laptop, my husband comes into the room like, a few minutes later. He goes, hey, there's this project that Carla's working on and it reminded me of you and your grandpa. And <laughs> I didn't believe him because I didn't know the word uh, nabarang at all. So I, I did end up eating some crow because I, I approached my dad later on. And I'm like, hey, what's this word? And he told me it was Cebuano, which is why I didn't know it. You know, if my husband hadn't been in there, I would have, I would totally missed it, but yeah, he, he's the one that caught it. So, hey, hon, good job. <laughs> Barang is the Cebuano word for a type of dark magic performed to inflict harm on someone. A mamba barang is one who practices this type of magic, sometimes using enchanted insects or other items, but they are so powerful, really all they need is to know your name and what you look like. Nabarang means cursed. So my auntie, she was the target, which is, I think it's called the binabarang, the person going through the actual hex. So the symptoms, she wasn't eating and she was pretty apathetic. She was, I don't know if she was like in a, in a comatose state, but I mean, she was, she was kind of responding but from what my dad told me he goes I know my sister's voice that was not her voice and 
she she hadn't eaten in weeks and um my grandma she ended up going to their neighbor because she she didn't know what to do because you know that's what you do in the province you just go to other people just to see what you can dig up so my grandma she went to the neighbor and the neighbor was like hey i recognize this she looks like she has a curse on her the neighbor knew and i'm going to butcher this term <laughs> albulari albulario the fa- uh, faith healer they hired a faith healer so from what my dad said because he was really young at the time they they didn't shoo him away which it's kind of weird because if there was a child in the vicinity i'm like no get away we don't know what's gonna happen but they just told him be quiet stay over there and he said he watched the ritual the first step in lifting the barang was to ask the target a round of questions and there was a lot of resistance elizabeth's aunt was not cooperating and this whole time it's this this I don't know if it was a disembodied voice or just a different voice, but it was not my aunt's voice, apparently. The next step was to physically coerce the answers out of the target. So they used a key, like the old type key, like a, not a skeleton key, but it's an old fashioned key is how my dad described it with, let's just call it a skeleton key. And the albulario pressed it between my aunt's fingers. Whenever the albulario asked a question and the entity inside of her aunt would not respond, the albulario applied more pressure on the key. So they were literally pressuring the answers out of my aunt. So the way they found out who it was, she kept putting on pressure until my aunt screamed. Like she couldn't take it anymore. And she said, okay, so How did you find uh, this person, my aunt? Because the entity was continuing to be difficult, they started with broad questions, getting more detailed and specific with each question. So they were like, okay, well, what province is it? What city is it? And so they found out Manila. And after that round of questioning like and narrowing it down, they found that it was someone that knew my aunt and uncle, and he plays a, he plays a part in this too. So the, they applied pressure again on that key. It, it came down to why, why, why would you place this but on, on this person? Turns out that it was a lady who said, and this is also coming from my dad. So a third party, we were not sure if there was something else on the side going on between my uncle and that person. But the reasoning was, was that my aunt was in the way of the relationship and she hated my aunt. The story continues after the break. My uncle and aunt ran, uh, I guess the equivalent of a meat stall or a butcher shop. And the lady just happened to sell I don't know what kind of wares she sold but she that's how she knew them and my and she had my aunt's name they I mean it was daily contact and that's how she knew my uncle and as far as barang comes like I said they don't they don't need a piece of your property or a piece of you they just need to know who you are know your face know your name and they have a bunch of power over you the albulario ended up threatening the entity within my aunt and said, you need to leave. And of course, they're not just going to be like, yeah, okay, my bad, sorry. Uh, no, they they resisted. So they took a charm. I don't know what it's called. It was described as a feather. My dad wasn't certain if it was a chicken feather, but a feather of some sort with some kind of charm attached to it. And they're like, if you don't lift this, I will use this on you. I don't, I don't know how they would because, well, obviously I, I don't, I don't practice, but I guess that was enough to get that person to lift that curse off of my aunt. So, I mean, that's essentially it. It took a lot of coercion, pressuring, and a threat with some kind of charm to get that entity to leave. 
And what I was told, I'm like, I asked my dad, I'm like, how do you know it even worked? Because, you know, I'm like, you're a child at this point, you're telling me. And he said, my sister started speaking again in her voice. And the first thing she asked for was food. I'm like, what? But I guess in that whole entire time, she didn't want it. She didn't eat. She consumed nothing. According to him, you know, she, she ate and she was fine after that. And my aunt and uncle, they lived out the rest of their lives and pretty much happily ever after. That was it. I was curious to know if anyone else in Elizabeth's family had ever found themselves the victim of Barang. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that. <laughs> so not like this, because um, I asked the same question to my father. I'm like, well, I mean, do you have any other experiences with that? Because you don't really run across that here in the U.S. His brother's mother-in-law? She, he, I guess she was just not a nice lady. <laughs> and in the Philippines, he, he, he did say that if you're there, I mean, you're subject to whatever may be over there. If someone doesn't like you, just watch out. So his mother-in-law, essentially, she had this weird swelling in her foot. It was like huge. And so the doctors, they did put an incision in there and there was sand. I know, right? There was sand that, came, he goes, as if somebody poured sand in it. But when they made the incision, there was no incision. So it looked like when they when they scrubbed it out, like maybe, maybe there's something medically that can explain it. But he said, nobody liked her. So <laughs> there's a chance that, you know, that someone did a kulam on her and like caused physical harm. Kulam is the Tagalog version of barang. I couldn't find anything online about a curse that causes sand to appear inside of someone's body, but it sounds utterly horrifying. As far as anything else, I do recall going to, I consider it small, but I went to the, pro, I went to Cagayan with my mother. And at the time there was, there's always weird family drama in the Philippines going on, especially over land and whatnot. And after we rode a bus for like a couple hours, we went to the village and I was related to like half of it. Elizabeth was introduced to a woman. I don't even know who she was. They're just like, oh, this is your auntie's cousin or some somehow related to you. I'm like, okay. Um, shortly after that, I don't know if I pissed her off, but shortly after that, from my knuckles right there, down to my entire arm right there. It was just covered in, it's not welts. It was these weird bumps. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, what did I touch? I'm like, am I having an allergic reaction? Then like I said earlier, that that's my logical mind going to it. I'm like, I don't, did I, I might've touched a fungus. I don't know. My aunt, because everyone's your aunt there. My aunt just said, oh, you went to so-and-so's house. And my mom's like, yeah, we had to meet the, you know, everybody that was on that land. And she goes, she's a bruja. Why would, why would you go there? She goes, she probably doesn't like you. And she's using your daughter to get to you. I don't know, but she probably put a curse on you guys. I'm like, I'm like, are you bumpy arm? That's, that's not even, but I just assumed I, I touched something terrible. <laughs> but you never know if you're going to piss somebody off. And if you go to a mangkukulam, all they have to do is bring your hair or a shirt. And now that I'm saying that, someone did our laundry over there. Oh, my gosh. We paid someone to do our laundry over there. Okay, well, there's that. Um, so it's entirely possible. I. Okay, well, <laughs> that's over and done with. It's fine. That was a, That was almost a decade ago. So, and I'm here. Been no sign of cursing that I know of. What I found the most concerning about Elizabeth's stories is that in every situation, the curse was inflicted anonymously by someone who had an unresolved problem with the target. People are resorting to magic before having a conversation. I mean, don't get me wrong, I am the queen of avoiding confrontation, so I get it. 
But in each of these situations, the one sending the curse didn't really gain anything. Elizabeth's uncle didn't leave her aunt. Elizabeth's arm healed just fine. So with these cases, I have to ask, what was the point? Other than to cause a temporary inconvenience. Chapter 3. The Tree Witch. Submitted by Pearl. Hey, I've been watching your show for a very long time, and I've often wondered if I should send in this story or not. It was really creepy when it first happened, but it wasn't the first time I experienced something like this. My name is Pearl. I'm an 18-year-old Native American, and I had a very weird experience four years ago. On a weekend in April 2017, in North Dakota, I was hanging out at home, drawing in my room. My sister Jeselyn came over with one of her friends, Tiana. Jeselyn and I are actually cousins, but we grew up so close to each other that we just call each other sisters. So don't get confused by the fact that she doesn't live with me. They asked if I was down to hang out with them and possibly go for a ride on a four-wheeler they had been driving. I was bored, so I agreed to go. I told my mom I was going to hang out with my sister, and she was fine with it, but told me to be back before dark. We drove around all day, and I was having fun for the most part. We live in a very small town with only about 200 to 300 people living in it. We were practically surrounded by nature, which made it more fun to drive around, plus nobody could get mad. Anyway, as we were driving, it turned into sunset, and I told my sister that I should start heading back in case my mom would get mad. Her and Tiana sighed. Jeslyn said, Just a little longer, please. I want to hang out a little more. There's this place near the woods I want to go to before we have to take you back. I looked at her confused. What place? Tiana looked at Jeslyn confused as well. My sister turned on the four-wheeler again and said, Come on, let's just go. So me and Tiana sat back down and Jess drove us. It started to get dark, but we ended up at the place she was talking about. It was a clear area by some trees, but it was kind of in the middle of nowhere. Jess parked the four-wheeler and said, Okay, we're here. We got off the four-wheeler and I looked at this huge hole in the ground. It wasn't that deep, but it was pretty big. Really? I said. You're making me stay up past curfew because you wanted me to see a big hole? There's nothing cool about this. Jess and Tiana laughed. Jess said, I know, but the hole is huge. I just wanted you to see it. I rolled my eyes at them and noticed that there were a lot of bush trees surrounding us. I immediately felt uneasy. When I was younger, my parents always told me to stay away from bush trees, especially if it was turning night. They warned me that the Native American tree witches lived in bush trees and they would attack if you got near their home. They're very mischievous and they bring harm upon those who see them. If you were to ever see one, you would suffer terrible luck in the future. Leave immediately if you're ever in the presence of one. Remembering this, I turned to my sister and her friend and said, maybe we should go. I don't think it's safe to be in this area at this time. My sister sighed once again and told me to relax. I hopped on the four-wheeler and said, Don't you remember the stories our relatives would tell us? The things that live in the bush trees? Aren't you scared? Just as I said that, we heard a noise from the trees, along with the sounds of the trees moving. My sister and Tiana looked at me, then at each other. I panicked and said, I don't want to wait here any longer to figure out what that was. Please, can we just go? Jess and Tiana walked quickly to the four-wheeler. My anxiety was boiling inside of me, waiting for her to start driving. I heard the noise again, and out of panic, I screamed for her to drive. We drove off really fast, and I held on tightly to Tiana, who was sitting in front of me. I remember turning around for a brief moment to see if anything was actually there. Maybe it was just an animal, you know? And just as I turned, I saw an old woman standing in front of a tree. She was short, slightly hunched over. Her hair was white, and her clothing was that of traditional Native American clothing. I didn't see her face, though. She stood there quietly, watching me and the others drive away. 
I screamed and cried for Jess to drive faster. We were all yelling and freaking out on the drive back to town. We eventually made it home. I sat outside for a few minutes with my sister and Tiana. We all panicked about what we heard. Jessalyn asked me what I had seen, so I explained it to her. Do you think... Do you think it was a tree witch? Jess asked. I nodded, in fear. She looked at me with a really worried expression. After we managed to calm down a bit, my sister dropped me off and said goodbye. She drove off with Tiana, and I walked inside my house. My mom was in her room, beating some earrings on her bed. I remember standing in the doorway, feeling so scared of what I saw. I wondered, am I the only one who's going to be affected? I'm the only one who saw the tree witch. What's going to happen to me? I stood there, wondering if I should tell my mom what had happened. I decided not to, since I knew if I did, I would get scolded for even being out that far at night. I just let my mom know I was home, and I went back into my room. I tried to sleep off what had happened. Like I said earlier, when tree witches are seen, they can bring terrible luck onto people, which is what I personally believe happened to me that year. I won't go into too much detail, but after that incident, about one or two weeks later, I was assaulted. Then my family life felt like it was getting worse by the day. I suffered emotional and physical abuse, and I lost my grandmother and aunt that year. Although this could have all been a coincidence, I personally believe the tree witch's bad luck played a part in all that happened, which is why I vow never to go near bush trees at night again. I couldn't find any information about these tree witches online, which doesn't surprise me. It sounds like they work hard to keep their identity hidden. The story of the tree witches most likely originated to keep people from disturbing their homes and discovering their secrets. In all the other stories today, the curses were brought on because of personal issues between the hexer and the hexed. But the tree witch? You just have to be a stranger who lays eyes on them. It's really no different from traveling outside of your home country. If you don't know the rules or customs, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. I am by no means saying that Pearl deserved what happened to her, but at the same time, who are we to say that the tree witches are evil? They were merely protecting themselves. So as I was doing some research on the ethics of cursing, I came across a very interesting Tumblr post by Will of the Witch. I included the link in the show notes if you want to check it out. The author defends the use of curses, explaining that they fall on a spectrum, from mild to severe. They liken the mild curses to a spray bottle and the target, a cat. You use the spray bottle to correct behavior when nothing else is working. A severe curse is like a tranquilizer dart when the target is a tiger. You would use the dart to stop the tiger if it became a danger to those around it. Just like with all things, it comes down to your intention. Are you protecting yourself or others? Are you seeking justice? Are you unleashing anger? It's up to you to decide what's reasonable and to be fully prepared for what's to follow. 